The Institute has partnered with three universities in India and the University of Houston in the United States. The Institute was founded in 2012 with a singular mission of creating 10,000 plus private leaders in the country. Ever since the organization has designed and delivered programs in collaboration with various institutes, universities and corporates to senior working professionals to help them make career transition into product leadership. The, the Institute has built and developed a community of 3,300 successful alumni leading the product data and design teams across the world. We are also knowledge partners for 250 plus organizations worldwide. You can find out more about the Institute and the programs offered on our website. Please check the chat window for the URL. And for those who have joined us via LinkedIn, please check the comment section for the URL. Once our speaker presents his insights, we'll open up for questions. Please keep your questions ready. You can post your questions in the Zoom Q&A window, or you can raise your hand and we'll unmute you and you, you can ask your questions directly. This session is being streamed live on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. So viewers on any of these channels, please feel free to post your questions in the comment section and we'll share it with our speaker. So without further delay, please allow me to welcome the very distinguished and renowned speaker for today, Mr. Zabiullah. Mr. Zabi is an experienced data scientist and business leader with 18 plus years of expertise. He specializes in AI-based decision analytics, automation, and augmented experiences to help brand transform their business strategies into opportunities. His areas of focus include institutional decision-making, risk mitigation, customer interaction enhancement, proactive learning through AI technologies, He's also passionate about problem solving and product transformation with AI and actively engages with emerging themes such as AI auditing, AI assurance, and AI security. He looks forward to engage in decisions and have network in these areas. Pleased to have you today with us, Mr. Zabi. Over to you. Thank you so much, Pragya. Would you, would you please allow me to share my screen? Yeah, thank you. And thank you everyone for joining this session. Raghya, just confirm to me once you're able to see my screen. Yes. Oh, thank you so much. All right, welcome you all uh, for this session on user-centric design approach. Um, I think we, we will be discussing about this topic for about an hour or so. Um, so let's get straight into that. I think, that, I think the reason we have to think about user-centric design approach, especially in the context of AI products is, in my experience, I have seen the it is really necessary for the success of AI products. I have been doing products for about uh, eight years now. Uh, prior to that, I have been a practitioner in data science and machine learning. I have seen, I have delivered a few, a lot of successful AI projects and also seen some um, uh, AI projects which tend to fail, especially those in which the user-centric design approaches are not allowed. And I think uh, IP has given this opportunity uh, for me to share my experiences on how uh, I have been able to use the user-centric user design approach in some of my AI uh, projects, as well as in the products that I have been currently managing. So excited to talk about that. So let's get into get into that straight away. So I think the agenda that I have set today is, uh, of course, uh, when, whenever we talk about AI, uh, we definitely talk about some of the techniques related to the AI and very quickly it tends to be very technical. So we will try to cover certain foundational topic uh, about AI for sure. And uh, also what we will try to do is, uh, I will also try to differentiate between uh, a traditional, I mean, a digital product versus an AI product. Uh, and then we will get into the user-centric design uh, framework. Uh, this is a framework that I have been following uh, uh, over a period of time. And I also like to share with you some of the implementation methods, implementation approaches uh, to this design-centric framework. And I, I'm also using a case study um, <laughs> from an open source world to really give you an idea that uh, how you can really apply some of these concepts into a real world problems. Uh, okay, so I think to, to start with, I have a poll to mainly to understand 
um, you know, how do you see AI products? So which of the following products do you think are really the AI product in your day-to-day -day life? So please go ahead and answer, answer this flow. Audience, you have 10 seconds to answer the poll. Here are the results of poll one. Sure. These are some interesting results. I see that nobody has responded. Nobody thinks the Uber or Ula cab booking uh, is an AI product and also same thing with Google Maps and even email spam filters. So all of these are basically AI products uh, just for your information. All right. All right, so I think what we'll do in the next 15 minutes is uh, we'll spend some time talking about uh, how to look at AI and how it basically works without really going into the technical concepts of AI and machine learning. Uh, we will also try to differentiate between uh, the digital products and AI products. This also gives you an idea that when, when do you think a digital product can become an AI product? And uh, I also like to help you understand that how to apply AI, right, and what are the how to look at the problems and how do you decide that AI is the right technique to apply to this particular problem domain, all right? Now to start with AI, uh, I think I wanna just give you, there are several definitions of AI. I'm sure you must have explored about uh, this topic in the past and there are several definitions of AI. And one of the simple definitions that I like to stick with is it is basically an intelligence of a machine. We have human intelligence, then obviously there is an intelligence intelligence of machine. Machine need not to be more like a hardware, it can also be a software. Uh, but in the industry, what I've seen is that uh, with respect to this definition, uh, the industry is more comfortable with calling a computer system as an AI that can mimic you know, the human-like intelligence. Uh, some, of the found, some of the basic human-like intelligence, such as our ability to see, our ability to understand the language, our ability to speak, decision-making, learning, et cetera, right? Uh, whereas in the academia, it is more looked at as a branch of computer science, and which means that uh, the, there are various different uh, domains within computer science, which has been leveraged today to build techniques and algorithms, and which is obviously uh, with an aim to create a kind of a computer system to mimic human-like intelligence. Okay. Um, now, whenever we talk about AI, we definitely talk about machine learning. And to give you an idea, while AI is a broader set of technology uh, concept, whereas machine learning is a subset of it, uh, machine learning today provides an ability uh, for any system to learn basic, uh, from the data. There are various different types of learning methods within machine learning, um, like supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning. Uh, likewise, there are certain very specific techniques, um, like say so for example, computer vision, so this helps an AI system to you know, identify or recognize an, an image or a video. Natural language processing uh, is on the domain of the um, languages, voice recognition is for the voice recognition, right? So likewise, there are some very specific techniques, whereas a machine learning is a broader set of uh, methods and techniques, which gives an ability to learn these computer systems from the data. So as we are talking about machine learning, Let's also try to understand a little bit more about uh, uh, how machine learning really works. And I think the, the better way to think about machine learning is, uh, is in the context of uh, a traditional software, right? So we all are familiar with softwares. So if you see how any software would work, you basically need to have a program, right? A program could, a program could be a set of rules, a combination of rules uh, that has been designed uh, to, to solve a specific uh, problem or for a specific task. Now this program, when it is available, uh, now the user can interact with this uh, program and then this program will generate an output, right? It's quite straightforward from that sense. Uh, now in, uh, in, 
in comparison to this, the machine learning, uh, the way the machine learning is designed is, is slightly different. So for the machine learning to work, you have to train a machine learning model, right? Now to train the machine learning model, you would require the past data and the output that you desire the machine learning to, to, to perform, right? So for example, if you, are, if you want a machine learning to identify the frauds in, your pay, in the payment transactions, you have to train a machine learning model by providing the past data, the past fraudulent or non-fraudulent transactions, and then train a machine learning model. Now, once you train that machine learning model, so then, uh, so th that's, that's basically what a program here represents. Now this program or a machine learning model will start interacting uh, and uh, on the, in, the, in the real world. And as in when the new payment transaction comes in, it starts identifying frauds and non-frauds, for example. Okay. Uh, I hope this, this gives you an idea about how machine learning typically works. Uh, if you try to understand this a little further with an example, uh, let's let's look at how you would create a software uh, for the same example of um, you know identifying frauds in the payment transaction. So as I said, you will basically build the rules and uh, the combination of rules. You can call them as rule engine. So this is your software, and uh, and as and when the payments comes through uh, the data into this into this software, which is a rule engine, and it starts identifying frauds and non frauds, right? Uh, so this is how you would do it. Whereas in case of machine learning model, as I said, you first need to build a machine learning model which is trained to identify the frauds and non-frauds. So what you would do to train that machine learning model is you provide the data about the past frauds and non-frauds, for example, and then you create a machine learning model. And then when you apply this machine learning model on the real world, which is once the start, once the new payment starts uh, coming into picture, once they pass through this machine learning model, then it basically identifies the new frauds and non-frauds. Right? Now, what is the real difference here? I think in the, in the first case, in the case of uh, traditional programming or, or a software scenario, since you are building the rules, most of the times the rules are static. You can visualize the rule to be this straight line in this particular uh, diagram. And then the way it can differentiate between the frauds and non-frauds is, as you can see on this diagram, right? The green color basically indicates the frauds and the red ones indicates the non-frauds. And it is, it is it's, it's uh, quite clearly doing its job. It is dividing the frauds and non-frauds. Um, but as you can also see, there are a lot of non-frauds which are not classified as frauds, which are in the same way the frauds are not classified as, as frauds as well, right? Now for the same kind of scenario, if you use machine learning, it would look typically like this. It won't be like a straight line because it learns from the vast data, it can uh, it has a capability to learn those patterns, learn, and then it can be it will be able to do a better job of classifying frauds and non-frauds. Right. Now, what are the other advantages? Like in case of if you are building rules in the traditional software, as you can see, it can do a lot of false positives, which is nothing but uh, classifying uh, frauds as non-frauds and vice versa. And it requires a lot of fine tuning to build these rules. You need to have domain experts, et cetera. And it is uh, extremely high maintenance. Whereas in the case of machine learning, I think as you can see that even machine learning models tend to make uh, mistakes such as they have classified some of the non-frauds as frauds and vice versa. So, but it will be much lesser than going with the traditional rule. And on top of that, a machine learning model can, can self-learn. Right? It can be set up in such a way that it can keep learning on the newer data and it can become more accurate. I hope this gives you an idea about how to look at machine learning and how, uh, how it can differentiate from a traditional software. All right, now, now thinking about the, any digital product and uh, how a digital product can be an AI product, uh, and how you can differentiate that. Think of any digital product, let's say uh, it could be a, a pizza app on your phone. Um, now in that pizza app, if you think there is any specific feature, which is where, the, where a machine learning is applied to solve a very focused problem. Like for example, you, can, you might have seen this on your pizza app, where if you are making a payment, it is 
showing you a very specific and targeted offers, right? Uh, now, generating these offers are identifying, maybe in the back end, it is also identifying frauds in the, uh, when you make a payments, et cetera. So this specific feature has been, uh, is, is, is the feature in this particular app where the machine learning is applied, right? So in this context, uh, ML is enabling a very critical feature uh, for a very focused uh, uh, task. So you can say that uh, even this Pisa app uh, is an AI app because a very specific feature is enabled uh, using machine learning. Now on the other side, um, if a machine learning is applied on, on the core uh, functionality of a digital product to solve a very focused problem, for example, Google search. So in the Google search, whenever you are searching something, it is recommending you ads, it's recommending you a promotion. It's a core part of their business. So, and this ads are being generated, uh, obviously based on a lot of data, based on machine learning. So machine learning is, is basically heart of this product, right? It is solving a very specific problem, but it is uh, heart of this product as well, okay? Um, the another example could be, uh, let's say, a machine learning is solving a broader problem within a digital product, right? Uh, for example, if you take the earlier versions of all the chatbots, uh, then you can see that uh, the, the way these chatbots used to work is um, first there could be certain rules uh, based on which you can pull out some information and it will start interacting with uh, with, uh, with the users. And then there is uh, there is some AI into it. There is some machine learning into it. Based on that, it is responding. Uh, now in this case, uh, machine learning is customized for a very specific chatbot. Uh, if if it is a chatbot designed for a call center for a specific business. So it is customized for that business. Uh, now, if you see on the other side, uh, post chat GPT, these chatbots have become more general, right? So in this case, the machine learning is very, is built with a general purpose in mind um, and it can be used for a wide area of applications. Uh, I think these are the four types of AI product that you would come across. And uh, the reason, I feel, I feel uh, this is important to look at it like this is because a digital product today can become an AI product uh, very soon where you would be applying a machine learning for a very specific feature or for the broader purpose. Right, so how do we, how do we think about applying a machine learning uh, for any given problem, right? Uh, for any user problem. So uh, think of all types of uh, user tasks uh, uh, that you come across. And I, so this is just a general rule of thumb, which helps you to understand that where it makes a lot of sense to apply AI or machine learning and where it doesn't make sense to apply your machine learning, right? So think of all the user tasks that you come across and then try to identify the task, a subset of tasks which you think uh, where the users find it to be very repetitive. It is very boring for the users and uh, they are willing to give up the control. Uh, like what I mean by that is that uh, it's okay if uh, an automated system can do the task, right? Uh, it, it doesn't make a big difference for the users. So all the tasks of this nature, which are repetitive, boring, and where the users are willing to give up the control, uh, this creates a greater scope to use AI and machine learning for the full automation, right? Uh, whereas on the other side, think about the tasks, which are very fun, which users are the humans tend to enjoy a lot, whether it could be creating a music, creating an art, or several such examples where um, humans tend to enjoy doing that task. And they also want, they are accountable for the outcomes of such tasks. And they are responsible and accountable for such tasks. And also the other type of task where it is of high value, where the outcome is really important, uh, the accuracy, the predictability is extremely important. Those are the tasks where even if AI or machine learning can be applied, we should avoid applying any AI or machine learning on those type of tasks. We should let humans do that task, right? Now, on the other side, we also will have set, uh, set of tasks which can be fun, but still uh, users are willing to give up control, which means like if you, if you, take, if you look at an example of recommending a music uh, on, on your apps, um, it's, it's not a big deal if the AI starts recommending uh, 
it, it's, it makes some wrong recommendations. Uh, so, so same thing with recommending the products on, on, on any e-commerce website, right? So where, whichever the task, even though they are fun, they are responsible, but it's okay for the users to give up and control. I think that, that, that's where you have to think about applying AI more in augmentation fashion. So what it basically means is this, the machine learning will do some part of the task, uh, whereas the rest of it will be, uh, will be done by humans, right? And ultimately the humans will be responsible or accountable for that, right? So that is how you can think about the augmentation task. Now there are also, there are a set of tasks where, which humans cannot do at a large scale, right? So let's, let's talk about that in a moment. Now, if you think about these products, which are fully automated on one side, right? You, you, uh, what I have seen in my experience is the, uh, it's mainly bringing efficiency and productivity to the user. And um, it's not really compelling to the end users. Like if you, are, if you are working on any sort of an automation project, you have to keep in mind, if your product is only automating some of the tasks, which has, happens to be repetitive or boring, the, uh, the value, uh, I mean, the, the end user, the end consumer won't see a value in those kind of products. Whereas with the augmentation, because it is making uh, the, the human capabilities or human tasks better, uh, it's always the best uh, strategy to have augmentation features, augmentation capabilities in your products. Uh, on the other, other side, we talked about some of the tasks which humans cannot do or the users cannot do at a large scale. Let's call that as greenfield. I think this is the area where uh, the pro AI products can generate tremendous value. Okay, I think some of the examples are, uh, I think I can easily think about an example like Uber or Ola. Um, the, the way they work, it's very difficult or uh, almost close to impossible for the humans to, to perform the same task which Uber or Ola is doing by bringing a uh, taxi to the people, et cetera, to the commuters. Right. So, um, yeah, this, this is how you can, I, I think what the, the question is that when you manage these kind of AI products, how do you make sure that your product has an USB, right? So one of the things that I've, I've come across is it's very important to determine the role of a human in your product, right? Even if you are, if your product is completely automated, uh, what is the role of human? You have to think about that. And I think if you are able to figure that out, that can be a real USB in your AI products. Yeah. Okay. So I think we can we can get into the main uh, concept of today's discussion. That is a user centric uh, framework. Uh, I think in the next twenty minutes, we'll, we'll I'll introduce you to the user centric design framework. We'll also talk about uh, some of the implementation tools, and then we'll see how we can apply that implementation tool on on uh, one or two case studies. All right. Um, so one thing is, I think before for for any successful AI product, we have to define the success of of, of that product. Right? I think for any product, as you can see, the user needs it, it, the product should fulfill the user needs. Uh, that is the main thing, right? That is a basic thing I would say. The second thing is that uh, user should be able to adopt to it. User needs to learn how to use uh, the product. But one other thing with respect to the AI product is that the user need to help the AI to evolve over time because uh, when you apply AI in the beginning, it may not do a perfect job, but as the user provides more feedback and as the more data comes in, the AI can evolve itself. So it's very important to accommodate uh, into the design that how user would learn, uh, how to use your product and how they can help AI to, uh, to do its task better. Okay, so along with user needs, user adoption, uh, user feedback, and uh, with that feedback, a mechanism to evolve AI, uh, this constitutes a successful AI product. All right, let's, let's get into the design framework. Uh, for um, So in any day, in any for, design framework, what I've seen is there are mainly four parts to it. Um, so one is a discovery phase. Uh, we'll talk about that. The other is a design phase, the build phase and adopt phase, right? So within discovery phase, you 
basically start with a, a high level problem or a, or a user goal that you want to uh, address uh, leveraging ai or uh, etc so it starts with that uh, then it you need to identify uh, the you need to identify the right kind of users the right segment of the users understand the user user persona comes into play here and also understand how they are uh, achieving that particular goal today uh, without your product or without ai uh, getting into the play right so uh, you you would do the journey mapping job to be done i identify the pains and gains we'll talk more about those things but uh, that that's the that's the next step then you also have to design what what is a to be experience that you are expecting for the users once you bring uh, ai capabilities into the product then the last thing is that you also have to identify what are some of the business actions are the processes that you need to have in place uh, for all of that or especially for the to be experience to uh, to be implemented so these are all some of the aspects that you have to think about within design phase uh, sorry within discovery phase now within design phase once you have the clarity about what are those specific tasks or actions that you want to automate or augment etc so here is where you need to identify those areas whether it is, is is it an automation that you are trying to do is it an augmentation that you are trying to do right so those are some of the areas that you need to identify where ai can be applied so once you have that clarity then you think about what data that you need what you have and what is really necessary for you to accomplish uh, that task and then the next thing is how you want ai models to learn from the data right so there is this thing that uh, we think ai is a, is like a is a magic wand uh, it's not basically you you have to design the ai you have to make the ai learn from the data as the way you want it to learn right so we uh, will look into that aspect uh, in some time uh, the last one is once you build these ai models you also need to have in place that how you are going to deploy it how you are going to manage it what i mean by management is as uh, as we have seen in the while we are understanding the machine learning that machine learning also can do some mistakes it it does comes with uncertainty so how will you manage those uncertainties right so uh, that's that's what your deployment strategy uh, should entail then last is a build phase uh, i think the build phase uh, obviously is for uh, what happens to be technical so once you understand uh, what are the areas where you want to apply ai right and what are those some of those tasks and then you start building the model you already have uh, gather i mean you already have identified the data start gathering the data you will start preparing the data so that it can be so that the ai can learn it uh, correctly uh, and then you, uh, you basically end up build, you, you end up building a model and then you uh, you have already identified the ways you want to maintain it the ways you want to manage it so that all will come into place now this is a stage where your ai model is is built as per your design and then uh, it's also been tested as per your design um, now what what is important to think about is how you want to how you want user to use this use this ai or use the product with ai right so we have to reflect uh, what ai can do uh, what are the challenges with ai what are the limitations of the ai and for those limitations what are some of the impacts for the user experience so there are some direct impacts and indirect impacts so we can look into that and also it's also important to think about uh, because uh, as ai is learning from the data and data can possibly have uh, the biases the human biases that means any ai system can also tend to learn from those human biases so it's important to ensure that uh, ai AI's decisions or tasks that AI is performing, they are unbiased. They are not biased towards certain group or certain uh, group of customers, uh, etc. Right, and also the user uh, user privacy concerns, and then also the security aspect of the AI. So all this comes into play uh, into the adopt phase. Now, all of this uh, uh, is mostly uh, a set of guidelines. Uh, but we need to have the right set of tools to apply uh, these uh, these guidelines so some of the tools that i have identified uh, which has really helped uh, us to apply these concepts um, for, yeah, one is the user empathy 
uh, you, I mean, we'll talk about this and how this helps you to do uh, very rigorous, uh, aggressive dis discovery uh, for your AI projects. Uh, we'll talk about uh, certain, uh, you know, the guidelines of data collection and how should you go about collecting the data? How should you think about the data? How should you think about data privacy concerns, et cetera? Um, so then the mental models, the, uh, it's, it's both user mental models as well as the creator's mental model. When I say creator's mental model, the person who is designing the AI, and we also talked about it's important to decide how you want the AI models to learn from the data. The mental model comes uh, comes into picture there. It's a, it's a very handy tool to ensure that there is a user mental model on one side, then there's a system mental model. Uh, there has to be, a, and, and then the creator basically bridges the gap between uh, these two end, uh, mental models. Uh, we'll see that in detail. And then also, once the AI models are learned and they are ready to perform a task, um, sometimes they tend to make mistakes. In those scenarios, it is very important to understand why they make mistakes, right? That, and if they are correctly doing the job, they are correctly doing a task. What is the knowledge that they have gained from the data? So we, as a product managers, our user experience people, we need to have that understanding of both the knowledge that AI models have gained from the data and also the reasoning uh, whenever they make mistakes or whenever they tend to go off from what is expected. Uh, we should have an ability uh, to extract reasons from such AI models. So, and then we'll talk about the safety and how to build trust with users uh, who, are, who, who are using the AI products and how they can provide feedback to evolve AI. The trust is important aspect there. So these are some of the tools uh, that we will talk about uh, in more detail. And to explain this, um, I, I chose this example. Um, this is a fictitious uh, hotel example, uh, Clear Bridge Hotel, and uh, where they are trying to uh, stand out compared to the other uh, hotels in the mid market and mainly their focus is to you know to provide better experience uh, especially to the business guest who comes to their hotel and using this example we'll try to understand that how each of those implementation tool can be applied in the uh, on this particular use case and and then we'll learn from that uh, uh, what are some of the things and how, how these tools are applied on this use case. Uh, but before we go that, uh, just have another poll for you. Um, just like to understand about uh, your re re ex recent experiences um, using AI products. Um, just go ahead and answer this poll and let me know what you think. Pragya, can we bring the poll? Yeah, thank you. Audience, you have 20 seconds to answer the poll. Please go ahead and answer the poll. Is glad to glad to know that uh, uh, your user, user experiences with AI products are improving uh, day by day, and uh, one of the reason that it is improving is uh, somewhere you are constantly providing feedback whenever you think uh, AI, AI has missed uh, providing you what you need. Right, I think that feedback is really important, and also over time we are learning to use AI products better. I think these are some of the reasons uh, why. Uh, you probably you are seeing that AI products are improving and your user experience is improving with AI products. Thanks for the feedback.
All right, so we'll focus on the implementation toolkit. Uh, this is the implementation toolkit that we that I talked about. Uh, let's start with user empathy. Um, I think I don't need to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, most of you must be familiar with user empathy already, uh, but I like to focus more on how you can apply user empathy, especially in the context of uh, AI products. Um, just like any other products, the goal of user empathy is to capture the user needs, to, I to, I to identify the users, first of all, understand the users, understand their uh, needs. And now here it is more about understand the user needs so that you can define a user experience for your AI. So uh, yeah, there are the first step of user empathy in this in this scenario is uh, obviously you have to understand who is your customer or who is your user, who is your end user. Uh, understand more about them. Try to identify the segment of the users who will be most impacted or affected by AI in your product, right? So um, that will be the goal. Um, I think um, yeah, uh, and then second most important thing is once you identify the user segment, once you know that these are the segments who really matters to me or for the AI uh, can really add value to this user segment, uh, then it is very important to understand, uh, you know, uh, what they do, what they think, right? What are some of their activities, et cetera. Um, I think you're familiar with, uh, with the empathy maps like this. Um, here, what you have to do is for those user segments, you have to basically try and list out all the different activities that those users, they, uh, they do. Uh, so these are some of the activities listed here under the, under the doing section. Um, then you also try to understand what, what are their thoughts, what are their feelings associated when they do those activities. Uh, you try to put that uh, into, the, into this whiteboard. Um, the next step is that you have to group this so that you can bring all the similar activities or similar thoughts under each one of this so that you have, uh, so that you'll be able to identify which of these themes are more uh, important, more relevant, et cetera. So you can identify the highs and lows uh, as, as it is depicted in this diagram. Once you have the activities and what they think and what they feel, then can you put this into the journey phases, right? As you can see, there are some journey phases examples here. Like the first step is travel to airport and and work and they, they check in at uh, the airport, etc. So you can start putting the different phases, different stages of the journey, uh, based on the activities that you have identified, right? So that is how you would uh, understand about your users, what they think, what they feel, uh, at what at each stage, what are the pains that they have. What are the gains that uh, that you that they are expecting, etc. So once you have that clarity, then your next step is to reflect and try to come up with that to be experience. What is that to be experience that you want to deliver, that you need to deliver to your users? Okay. So still we are not thinking about uh, uh, bringing AI, etc. So it is completely a different activity. Just try to understand the user needs as clear as possible, try to understand those pains um, that they are going through at each stage of the journey, try to identify the gains that they are expecting. Once you have that clarity, then you think about what is that ideal to be experience that you want to provide, right? At this stage, forget about the data, forget about AI, just reflect and put your ideas out there. And then uh, do the same exercise, group those ideas into, into the common themes um, and then uh, also think about uh, what thinking that it can resonate, it can, and what are the feelings that it can have. Uh, so this is basically your to be experience that you that you want to deliver. And here is also this is also the stage where you try to identify uh, those most important uh, critical, uh, you know, the themes that you want to focus, and also uh, and and those themes which you think are not really going to result a, a big user experience, right? So yeah, so step one is basically that you understand the user journey, understand the user needs. Uh, step two, uh, craft out your to be experience. And then the step three is here is now, uh, here's where you need to think about how those user needs can be aligned to uh, 
uh, how AI can be applied, right? So we talked about one uh, simple framework uh, before. Um, just, just use that framework and then think about what are some of those user activities that you have identified and whether those user, what, what, are, what is the nature of those user activities? Should you apply complete automation there? Should you let the user do how they are doing without disturbing it, which is what this human centric is? Or you want to help user do better by bringing AI uh, into the play, which is what this augmentation is, right? So use this uh, guideline or a rule of thumb to identify uh, what kind of user needs uh, that you need to try to fulfill by applying AI and how you want to apply AI on those uh, user tasks. Okay. All right, uh, what is the next step? Now you know the user needs. Now you know what you need to do, how you need to apply AI on those user needs. Now the next step is now you're ready to uh, st start applying AI uh, onto, onto those specific user needs. But when we do that, it is important to think about or to provide a goal for that AI to achieve for each one of those tasks that you are either trying to automate or you are trying to augment, right? So define a goal, what should be the goal? For example, um, if you um, want to identify, let's say if you want to recommend a product to the user on your app using AI, then what is the goal here? The goal is, that the product recommended product has to be very relevant. It has to be timely and it has to be such that it, it creates an action in the sense the user should be able to add that to the, to the card, right? That, that is the goal that you need to define, right? So once you define that goal, uh, it also gives you an idea that how AI should start differentiating because in order to recommend something, it has to differentiate between a huge repository of products and catalogs Right, it, it, it gets an idea that how it should really differentiate uh, between this versus that, right? So it can refine its action better once the goal is in front of AI, right? Once that is clear, then how will you measure that? You need to have an idea about uh, once you have built the AI model for this particular goal, what are some of those metrics and KPIs that you will use to measure the AI's performance on that goal, right? So. Uh, here on the slide, uh, also what is important to note is the AI can do false positives and false negatives. So false positive and false negatives for those who are not aware of what this, what this is. In, in like we, took, we talked about this example of product recommendation. If your AI is recommending a product, but that is not relevant, uh, that's false positive. If your AI is recommending uh, a product which, uh, I mean, if, if AI is not recommending a product, which is really uh, something that user is expecting to see, uh, that's false negatives, right? So AI can do these kind of mistakes. So it's very important to even measure the AI's performance on these aspects, okay? Uh, once you have that clarity, then you would know what are the risk. The risk is not just the false positives and false negatives. The risk can also be that it is doing a great job providing let's say for example, recommendation to certain set of customers, certain set of users, but it is not doing a great job. It's to other set of customers. That means it is not fair. It is not doing a fair recommendation to all types of users in general, right? So these are some of the best, big risk of AI. And lastly, even if it is doing a great job today, when you are measuring the performance, over time its performance can deteriorate, right? Because it has learned from the data at one point of time. Now you are applying uh, that learning um, uh, in, in, over time, but over time, whatever it has learned, it may not come into use because, uh, I mean, of course that, that, that is based on what use case that you are applying and how, how much dynamic uh, scenarios are involved, uh, how fast the user behaviors are changing, et cetera, and how fast the data is changing. Uh, but it is important to note that AI performance can also deteriorate over a period of time. So these are some of the big risks of any AI model. Uh, having a picture, having a clarity of all these different aspects are important at this stage.
All right. So if we if we start applying what we just learned on that uh, clear beach uh, hotel, who, who where the goal is where they want to uh, personalize or improve the customer experience, especially among the business guests, right? So what are some of the findings that they have uh, uh, they have achieved by applying uh, by using uh, user empathy? What they learned from that user empathy is that whenever the business guest checks in, the staff doesn't know the user needs uh, ahead of time, right? They doesn't know the name of the of their guest, even though the bookings have been done. They doesn't know what kind of room that they are looking at, etc. Because of which the check-in experience takes a lot of time, and it's also because of this the rooms are not really are ready. Rooms may be ready from a hotel perspective, but they are not ready as per guest expectation, right? So these are some of the areas which was resulting a bad experience uh, in Clearbridge, in our example. So this is something identified you have applying the user empathy. Uh, now, using the same user empathy in the to be experiences, the team who was working on uh, this project, they identified that okay, what is what is possible to deliver. Right, so a personalized experience, which means as soon as the guest enters in, if we know the guest name or if we know how to correctly pronounce the guest name, if we know ahead of time uh, what what is the guest expecting, what is the room temperature to set, uh, what are the service options uh, that this customer or this guest uh, prefers, whether the wake up call is to be set or not. Right, so these are some of the to be experiences that they have identified by applying the user person, sorry, the, by applying the user empathy. Okay, and then they have identified a couple of areas where AI can be applied. Uh, one such area is hyper-personalization, where they have grouped certain activities, where they will try to uh, leverage AI to identify for each guest, uh, what is that uh, specific experiences that they can provide, right? So that, area or the application uh, area or domain is the hyper-personalization that they have identified. Okay, so we'll take a pause here and then uh, I'll bring another poll. I want to understand from you that uh, which of the following application areas that you think where AI can be applied or AI can help you achieve these tasks? Yeah, uh, please go through each one of them, uh, think about it and see do you think if AI can help uh, solving or applying on this area. Audience, you have 10 seconds more to answer the poll. Great. Yeah, I think I think it's almost like equally distributed. Uh, but um, yes, uh, AI can be applied on all these domains effectively. Yes, for some of these domain areas, yeah, um, AI application has been uh, from quite some time. But some of these areas are new uh, because the techniques or the algorithms were not available till recently. Uh, but yeah, these are all all these are the domain uh, where AI can be applied. All right, so what is the next thing that we have in the toolkit that is a data collection, right? So what you have achieved in user empathy is that you have been able to identify those application areas where AI can be leveraged. Of course, there could be certain application areas where you have decided not to apply AI as per that uh, rule of thumb framework. Um, but for whatever the areas that you have, the, that you have determined, uh, to for the AI or machine learning to work, um, the data collection is more applicable for those areas. Um, so what we need to do is that you have the user needs uh, for each one of those areas. 
you have to translate those user needs to the data requirements. So what it basically means is, um, see, one other thing, there are a lot of regulatory guidelines and frameworks available um, today, which will help you to understand how to collect the data, how to train a machine learning model on what kind of data you need to train it on what kind of data you cannot train a machine learning model. So obviously uh, I will strongly suggest you to follow those uh, regulatory and governance guidelines, which are more which are applicable to your industry or to your market. Uh, on top of that, I just want to share some of my experiences and how uh, I have personally applied uh, these guidelines um, in the context of AI, building AI products. Um, so one is uh, ensuring your data is complete, right? So what I mean by that is, uh, see, AI is basically learning from the data. And we have already discussed that AI can, I mean, that data can also have biasness, right? And that data is not necessarily complete all the time, right? So, but at least make an attempt to ensure that the training data is complete. You have all the data elements in that training data, which is essential for for building a machine learning model. Okay, um, so how, how do you think about uh, accessing the data, right? So I think first is that first you identify what is the data that you really need. Without that, you cannot attempt to build any kind of uh, AI application or machine learning model. Second is what data you want so that you, you so that the AI can can perform better, right? Uh, the third is that uh, what data you think is is good to have, right? So uh, most of the and at least you need to make sure that you have the data that you need. But it is important to also think about what data that you want. Maybe you you will not get that data instantly, but having that understanding is important, right? And then once you have the data, you can basically match and try and understand that for, for the AI to really, let's say, uh, generate recommendation or personalized user experiences, what are the different aspects that are essential to have to be available in the training data? So that is what is matching user needs with the data needs. Uh, when you do that, it's, it's also important to understand, are you uh, like, uh, you should not be using the data which compromises the, the privacy, which compromises the uh, security aspect, right? So even if that data is the is the data that you need, uh, it is better to just not use that data. Um, the other aspect that you have to think about while collecting the data is the data that you have collected that you have decided to use. You also have to make sure that there is a balance between two potential issues that any AI or machine learning application can have that is underfitting and overfitting, right? Now, just uh, a simple definition of this, uh, these are very evolved areas. Um, like if you talk about overfitting, uh, so if you, if you think about how typically a machine learning model is built is, you first try to train that on the training data, which happens most of the times it happens to be your historical uh, data, data which, which you believe that it has all the required patterns uh, for the machine learning to learn from it. Right? So that's your training data. But you also try to test this model on some on some new data, on the new data sets. Right? It could be a current data set or it could be um, uh, you know, the data set that you have not essentially used for the training. Right? That's a test data set. The data set that you have not used for training, that's a test data set. Now, overfitting is, suppose you, uh, so you have built a machine learning model on the training data set. But on the performance KPIs, on the performance metrics, if your model has done really well on the training data, but it is not really doing that well on the test data, right? So that seems to be an overfitting problem, right? That is an overfitting problem because your model, your, your training data is such, has been uh, extracted in such a way, has been collected in such a way that it is really training your model too well but on, on the real world data, on the test data, it, is, it tends to fail. One, one simple reason for this is your training data is not really representative to your real world data, right? So many times when, when we are trying to collect data, 
we tend to compromise this uh, that we, we just collect whatever is available, but we also have to make sure that the data that you have collected is representative to the general user expectations or the general population or not, right? If you fail to do that, it can result in overfitting, okay? The same, uh, scenario, in the same scenario, it can also result to underfitting. Underfitting is completely opposite to what we just discussed about overfitting. So it is important there is a balance, right? And uh, to make to ensure there is a balance, you have to collect the data in such a way that it is really representative to the general population or the general set of uh, users for which you are trying to solve a problem. Okay, and then the lastly, you also have to make sure that uh, uh, the the data that you are collecting has is fair, right? Like for example, uh, one example that I can think of is. Um, like for example, if, if, a, if a company is selling products mainly targeting for males for a period of time, but they recently started selling products for females as well. Now you can imagine the data that they would have, it will be uh, predominantly for male population and underrepresenting for the female population. So when you have, I mean, just, that's, that's just an example, but uh, uh, this is how there can be an imbalance in the data. And because of that imbalance, when you train machine learning model, it can be more biased towards females in this example, right? It can be more favorable for males in this example, right? So you have to commit to ensure that data has all these uh, balances. It's, uh, it's re really representing the today or tomorrow's uh, situation, not really uh, a very past situation. So it's also not a good practice to take your uh, training data deep in the history, try to track as recent data as, as possible. So these are some of the uh, guidelines that you have to make sure that uh, while you are collecting your data. So the second thing is with respect to how you source the data, right? So we talked about uh, there will be some data that you will already have, right? There will be some data that you want to get it from outside, which is internal and external, right? So whenever you're trying to get data from external sources or even for that matter, the data which is coming internally, you also you, you have to think about how that data is getting generated because many a times the biasness can come from the source, right? Um, I think you, you, you just have to keep this in mind that uh, ML, the way the ML works is garbage in, garbage out. That means if your data is inaccurate, if your data is not balanced, so obviously you cannot expect the machine learning to perform uh, right to your to your expectations. So uh, validate your data sources. Ensure that uh, the the sources from which you are getting data are verified. Right. Um, sometimes you have to create data. Right. Which means that uh, you already have some data. You might also want to create certain more, some more variables, uh, leveraging your domain expertise. Right. So this is a typical scenario, especially when you are training your machine learning model for decision making. Right. So in that scenario, a lot of times um, based on the domain knowledge, based on the domain knowledge about the business, you might want to compute some variables. Say, for example, you, you decide that, okay, you have income and education, both as individual data points, but you believe that the ratio of these two would, would be better for ML to learn about, let's say, um, the spending power of consumers, right? So then you will compute the ratio. Just a simple example, but there, the, there could be many such more complex examples where you will try to create your data leveraging domain expertise. So it's important to be very careful about this because this is also uh, a, uh, maybe an opportunity where you can bring more biasness into the data, right? So yeah, that, that's, that's on sourcing the data responsibly. Now, there are a lot of use cases where you need to, um, you know, have your labels, create your labels in the data set. Uh, now, basically what are labels is, in the training data set, uh, you need to have uh, certain labels for the task that you are expecting your machine learning to perform. For example, if you're trying to build, let's say, a face, facial recognition system, now for to train that kind of machine learning model, you need to first provide uh, all the historical uh, let's say the images of, uh, of, uh, of people, 
when you provide a lot of images of the people, you also have to label those images, like who this, I mean, uh, who is the person in this particular image, for example, right? This is at the training stage. Once you train the model on such training data, then it can basically start identifying the person correctly in the real world scenario, right? So that labeling part is, is mostly, or most of the times it is done by humans, right? And we call them as raters. So uh, if, if your application has this scenario of labeling, where you are leveraging a lot of raters, uh, there are a lot of uh, companies who uh, typically outsource this activity. And um, so it's important to make sure that the, uh, the, the way the raters are selected to do this particular task, it, it aligns to how you are designing your UI application. Yeah, sorry, your AI application, right? Uh, you, rate, you like to have a diversity in your raters because even the raters can bring biasness in the data, in the way they rate, right? It's also important to understand how they are rating, what is the process of rating, what is the mood, uh, are the uh, psychological, uh, psych I mean, psychological aspect of the raters. So the, all these are important aspects whenever you are leveraging or whenever you're engaging with any third party who is providing you this labeling services, okay? So there's also an area where uh, you can bring inaccuracies and biasness in your data. All right, uh, so that's on data collection. Um, now, if you see for this uh, clear bit use case, uh, how the team was thinking about the data in order to build that hyper-personalization. So they identified the data that they have already, uh, especially they have the room service data about their users. They also have the credit card information, the thermostat usage, the booking information, and from the public domain, they can also obtain the weather data, right? Uh, they also had, they also wanted to access this event data for the third party sources. They also wanted to understand, are there any shopping festivals in the nearby locations, the past, uh, uh, guest complaints, etc. So th this is how they were thinking about uh, what data that they already have, what data that they need, and do they have the data internally? Do they have do they have to get the data from a, from external sources? So this is how they thought about it, and they and this also gives you an idea that uh, maybe there are some data sources that you may already have it, but it is not a good practice to use. For example, uh, let's say the credit card data. Right. So the team decided not to use credit card data uh, because it might violate the uh, the privacy uh, concerns of the users. So they decided to avoid using that data. All right. So uh, we'll quickly talk about mental models. I think it's an involved topic, but the key message that I want to give here is: uh, so you need to you need to have. Uh, a user mental model that basically how the user is thinking to use this application which you are building and uh, what is also the systems mental model the systems mental model is like if i am building an ai model as a data scientist i also i need to have a clear picture that how i would uh, how i would generate the recommendation for example for let's say for existing customers or for versus the uh, new customers and uh, how do they typically access uh, my platform and where will I uh, push the recommendations and how will I decide, how do, how do I want AI to decide which are the right recommendations, which are the incorrect recommendations, or what recommendation should not be shown to the new customers, what recommendation to be shown to the new existing customers. So this is also an, a mental model that I as a creator of an AI model would have uh, other than the user mental model. But what I want to emphasize here is it's important to bridge the gap because both of this user mental model as well as a system mental model has to come together, right? If there is a gap between these two, then I think it will result into a bad user experience. Right? Um, there is a general framework that uh, I found it to be very useful. Uh, about any kind of mental model is, especially from a user standpoint, is one is just these three questions, when to use uh, a specific uh, application or when to leverage AI's recommendation from a user perspective, right? And how to use it is another question that a user would have and what it can do for them, 
right? So if you start thinking about user mental model from these three, I think you will mostly cover all the different aspects that you need to know uh, from a user mental model perspective, right? Yeah. So I think when to use it and how to use it will create a transparency to the user. What it can do for them and how to use it will, will allow them to understand about uh, how AI or AI, AI or the AI product is helping them to achieve something. And they know when to use it and when not to use it. That means they will be in a control, right? And lastly, uh, when to use it and what it can do, uh, this will enable them to think about the value that they are getting from the AI product, okay? So this was a very uh, helpful framework to think about the user mental model. When we think about the system, mental model or the system uh, model. Uh, this basically helps, um, you know, how ML can learn uh, or how ML can be trained on the given data set, right? So having that picture that, okay, look, uh, in, if I'm building a recommendation engine, I have set of old customers. So most likely you have a lot of data about your existing customers. And uh, most of your recent customers or new customers will be very less. That, that there itself, there is a, uh, there is a balance, imbalance, you can say. Um, then a lot of my existing customers will, I will access their views, likes, ratings, purchases, right? I may not have that much of data about views, likes, and ratings from my existing customers. And then um, I will have a lot of patterns about what these existing customers are buying along with what, right? That means I can come up with better recommendation um, for, for my existing customers. But for my new customers, I may not have so much of data, but what can I do? I mean, can I, can I identify the similarity between the existing customers and my new customers? And then the recommendation that I would be uh, generating for my existing customers who are very similar to this new set of customers, maybe I can push the same recommendations to them, right? So this will help you to come up with those strategies. It will also help you to understand if your machine learning fails in certain scenarios, that's the surprise element. What, what, is, what is your backup like, right? So you need to have some way of correctly recommending certain things, especially in those scenarios where machine learning fails to generate correct recommendations, okay? So this mental models will help you to also decide what data sets are required and what do you need to have in those data sets that you are thinking to create a training, uh, training data from it and then train your machine learning models, okay? So yeah, as I said, there has to be a, you have to attempt to bridge that gap between your user mental models and um, your system mental models. Um, couple of tips that I want to share here is, uh, many a times what would happen is that, especially in the, in the scenarios of false positives and false negatives, where you, it's very critical for the user to, let's say, to see something which is recommended by AI, for example, and that happens to be inaccurate, then it does impact their user experience and you need to have that idea. So user mental model will give you that idea that what it might result to, and then you will have some backup, right? So in those scenarios, maybe you can uh, use certain rules, um, which, which mostly happens to be correct instead of uh, depending on machine learning in those scenarios, right? So I think that's how it helps the mental models, right? Now, going back to our case study of ClearBitch. So here, um, what we have really seen applying the mental model is they have clearly identified what are some of the components of room service that they want AI to really understand really well, right? So uh, things like since the order arrived and otherwise, it has to be accurately understood by AI in order to come up with uh, more personalized recommendations, the response time of the order, the convenience of placing an order. So these are some of the aspects that they want to be very careful uh, when they are building an AI model. They also identify the, um, the risk because end of the day, what they want to basically present to the uh, guests who are checking in is with, uh, with more personalized, uh, you know, the, the custom, niceties, uh, it could be a weather setting, it could be the snacks, or it could be uh, wine of their choice, right? But here the bigger risk is if that preference is completely not aligned to what user is expecting, 
uh, that was a bigger risk. And they were very conscious about these aspects uh, you know, before, they, before they were training the machine learning model. Okay, I think uh, um, at this stage, you have all the clarity, what are the user needs, what aspects that uh, where you can leverage AI, what aspects you should avoid leveraging AI. And if you are using AI, then what are the risks, how you will be performing, I mean, how you will be measuring its performance. You have, and then what data that you need, what data that you have and what data uh, that you need to have and what data you're not supposed to use it. So you got all this clarity. Now I think you'll go ahead, your data science team will build and validate the model as per this. Now we'll talk about once the models are built and tested, then what? This is the most important aspect. So you have trained your model as per the design. Now you need to think about how you will educate the user to use this model and how, you, how to get the feedback from the users so that you can evolve the performance of the model. So that is the last section of this uh, discussion today. Um, yeah, I think some of the thing is, uh, one is you have to set right expectation uh, for adoption whenever we talk about AI ML in a, in a product, mainly because AI uh, machine learning outcomes or AI outcomes are very uncertain. They are very probabilistic, which means that they can make mistakes. They will come with certain level of accuracies. They come with certain margin of errors. And you have to make sure that you set that expectation with your users in what scenarios uh, AI can make mistakes and where it can really do well and where it cannot do well, right? So setting that expectation is, is very important. Uh, so some of the guidelines uh, uh, that really helps here is, it's always a good practice to uh, explain the technology capabilities and, ex and limitations, right? I, I just took one example from Google design here. So if you look into this first example, Plant Pal is an, is an application or is an app to recognize uh, or to identify the species of plants. So on, on its opening page, what they have mentioned is the, it helps you to identify 400 plus plant types native to US. They have very clearly called out that where it can really help you to correctly identify and how many such uh, like plants it can correctly identify 400 plus. Now, what they should, uh, maybe what is the other, other in, what, what they should avoid, an example of what they can avoid is this kind of messaging, right? A botanist can keep, keep in your pocket, it can be used to identify any plants and determine if it is safe for people or pets, right? So here they have written any plants. It cannot be possible because uh, if, uh, since they are leveraging AI and machine learning, it cannot possibly help identify any plant, right? So this is just an example of how you can be more transparent about uh, uh, your AI capabilities and limitations. Uh, another example is it's always good to talk about benefits and talk less about technology, right? So this is another educational app. How, uh, so as you can see that uh, in first case, they have mainly talked about the benefits that the users can get from this application. Um, in other case, they the messaging is completely talking about the technology like neural conversation models and natural processing models. This is something to avoid and this is something to, to follow in order to set the right expectations for the adoption. Uh, the second thing is uh, how do you onboard the users? Right? So one is you're setting the right expectation as a first step. Now, how do you onboard uh, the users? So onboard the users in several stages. Right, so identify those uh, different stages where you want to introduce uh, AI to the users, right? And a um, couple of things is that be upfront, you know, what your product can do and what it cannot do, right? And then while you are onboarding the user on such product, create a feedback mechanism. And when they and when you think the AI can fail at this stage, then always bring uh, human in the process. Like uh, these are some examples where you can see that uh, there was an incorrect citation done by AI. Now they are basically suggesting that to help you find better citation, you can start chatting to a certified tutor, not to an AI model, right? So whenever AI makes a mistake, this is how they are backing it up. This is how they are managing or mitigating that risk, okay? 
So that's the second one. And third one is more important. It's uh, how will you take a feedback uh, from the users? Uh, and then how do you use that feedback uh, in order to improve your AI mode? So these are a couple of examples where they are clearly communicating how they can and why they have to provide a feedback and how they can provide a feedback. It's clearly articulated, right? So we would need to have both implicit and explicit feedback, right? So uh, you, you, the feedback that they will directly provide whenever there is an issue, or also you also actively start tracking the usage behavior, and the user's behavior uh, into your app. So that will uh, that will also help you to manage, you know, the 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 failures whenever they occur. All right, so now going back to the clear bridge, how they have actually launched the product or how they have uh, you know, trained their users and make them use the personalized experience. In this context, what they have done is they have launched certain surveys, they have done certain interviews. They mainly try to understand how would uh, their guest feel if their data is used in, to create more personalized experience for them. And uh, uh, that, that's one thing. And second is, uh, um, and I, in fact, they also mentioned that they are the, the guests are very happy to see the value that they would be getting by uh, allowing them to share some of their data. Right? So, and then they also try to, using the same interview process, they try to educate the users that uh, uh, what they can expect from AI uh, and uh, what, what and how they can report if some of certain recommendations are uh, personalized experience options that uh, the hotel provides, if that doesn't meet their expectations, what guests can do, right? So this is how they have done it um, with respect to you know, adopting the users for the AI applications. All right, uh, so we are at the end. Just like to summarize uh, things here. Uh, I think what is most important is you, uh, in the entire process, uh, you have to put user in the center, which means that you started thinking from a user perspective. And then uh, the last step is also ensuring that user learns and understands uh, how AI will be uh, creating an impact. Uh, when you do this activity, I think a strong suggestion is to involve a diverse team. There are several scenarios where uh, this activity has been completely done by one team and it has resulted in biasness. It has resulted in uh, misalignment. Um, build mental models, it's really, really important at every stage. Um, then identify the possible data sources, identify the data sources that you can use, that you cannot use, follow the regulation practices. And it is always better to have a bigger idea whenever you start this activity. Then you can start narrowing it down, break that into pieces, uh, you, you can bring agile methodology into, into the play here. Uh, very importantly, whenever you are using AI and machine learning, identifying those risks, the potential risk and putting a mitigation strategy is extremely important. And last but not the least that, how do you train the users to use AI and how they can get feedback from them to evolve the AI applications. All right, so we are at the end, uh, but before you go, I just like to show you this video. This is a real world uh, problem where, uh, they will where, where they will explain that how they are applying AI to solve a business, prop, a business use case and then how the design, user-centric design approach has helped them to achieve it. Uh, Prakash, shall I play this video or you want to play it from your end? Mm -hmm. You can try playing it. If uh, the voice is not audible, I'll play it from my end. Sure. Is the voice audible? No. Okay, wait, we'll play it from our end, please. Give me a moment, please. Sure. Dang, a new host on Centered. 
My focus is how to design with emerging technologies, like artificial intelligence. Today we're in Hyderabad to meet with the team behind Bolo, a mobile app that's helping children learn how to read anytime, anywhere, using just their voice. More than 50% of grade five children cannot confidently read grade two level text in their native tongue. So let's hear directly from the Bolo product team themselves on how they're designing for voice UI and machine learning to help solve child literacy. Bolo is effectively a speech-based reading tutor. Reading is such a fundamental ability for you to succeed, um, but still worldwide, there are about 517 million children who are not functional readers even by the age they are young adolescents. If you have to learn to read, what you really need is time on task and practice and one-on-one -on -one attention. In a country like India or many parts of the world, there are only so many schools that can be built and there are only so many teachers that can be trained. So first and foremost, it's a scale problem. Then it's also a problem of access to material. And finally, it's also a, a challenge of the kind of feedback you can get from your parents and from anybody around you who can help you learn to read. So really, if you have to think, how could you really bring technology to help to bear on such a big problem, um, that's where Bolo comes in. It uses the same uh, voice technology and speech recognition technology that Google uses for its assistant. The additional thing that we, ma we have done over that is we have made it available offline on a device, right? So you don't need to be connected. You don't need to have internet. And it can still, in real time, hear and listen to you and give you that feedback. It's just the magic of them being heard and it being recognized what they are reading. As we heard from Nitin, we need to ensure that applications of machine learning and voice UI are grounded in user needs. By leveraging on-device ML and its speech recognition capabilities, Bolo can provide corrective feedback at scale to children everywhere reading aloud. Can you tell us about Bolo's users? There are two primary uh, kinds of population that we are trying to serve in this case. The first population is definitely children who are trying to learn to read their native language or English as a second language. The second one is the parents because these parents are the ones who are actually owning the devices. Would you like to take us through the app? So I just want to take you through the onboarding part. The primary purpose of having this onboarding is to let the parents be aware of what exactly the app does. The three steps that we want to take the parents through is, first of all, who is Dia? Because Dia is the central character in the app. Dia is the one who is playing the role of a person who's helping the child learn to read. The second thing that we want to do is pick which language does the child learning to read? The third thing is the parental consent, which is the most important part because we are dealing here with children and different governments in different areas have different rules and regulations with the data of children. Google has a perception of taking the data and all kinds of controversies. We have to be very sure that everyone understand that what kind of implications are there and the data is not being sent anywhere. The third thing is you as a parent would be giving consent to that I am giving this device to my child and my child would be able to use it. So we take the parent in the onboarding through these three steps. So the first thing that we do is we introduce Dia and she will help their children learn to read. Now, people can select from different languages that they want their children to learn to read. So for example, if my native language Because we are dealing here with children and different governments in different areas have different rules and regulations with the data of children. Google has a perception of taking the data and all kinds of controversies. We have to be very sure that everyone understands that what kind of implications are there and the data is not being sent anywhere. The third thing is you as a parent would be giving consent to that I am giving this device to my child and my child would be able to use it. So we take the parent in the onboarding through these three steps. So the first thing that we do is we introduce Dia and she will help their children learn to read. 
Now, people can select from different languages that they want their children to learn to read. So, for example, if my native language is Hindi, and we also have an English-only version. So, every transition or every screen, new screen that you come across in the app will have some sort of audio feedback there. So this is the second step where we are actually teaching how the app would be used and this is where we slide in the permission for that we need the mic permissions because if the phone is not able to listen to your voice if we do not have the permission the app would not be able to use it wouldn't be able to give you that feedback in terms of which word you read correctly or incorrectly exactly so you see there is a cursor movement there now she's asking me to read and you see her stance change so i'll read, learn to read with me and she's telling that the words that the children read correct will turn green like this. So we are explaining the feedback that will be happening later on in the app as well. So this is the consent screen where we all tell the parents about what exactly is going to be the data policy or the privacy policy of the app and none of the data that their children would use in the app would be sent to our servers. So this is the last step in the onboarding. As we learn from Junaid walking us through the app with Dia, it's even more important that we understand user mental models when it comes to designing ML-driven experiences. We need to make sure that we onboard users by setting their expectations and that we focus on the benefit, and not the technology being used. Initially, the focus of the app was more on performance. Mm. How many words do you get right? Uh, okay. Now we are moving our focus to progress. Oh, interesting. Okay. Right? So because uh, children would lose the motivation to actually read the whole story. Mm -hmm. So now we are encouraging them towards progress. If they read a sentence right, if they get few words right in the sentence, we mark it as complete. We encourage him for every single word that he may get right. And uh, the speech model really hasn't changed a lot, but how we represent it, you know, how the design looks today is very different from what it looked earlier. As you said before, children are often afraid to get it wrong. Well, machine learning models can also get it wrong. Can you unpack for us what an example of a false positive and a false negative is in the Bolo experience? The false positive is that sometimes they read the word incorrectly, but, the, but machine learning actually recognizes it correctly and moves on. Mm -hmm. Then there is false negative, that the child might be saying the word correct, but the speech model wouldn't really get it. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't be able to hear the child saying it right. Then the, you know, the page wouldn't move forward, mm -hmm. the child would be stuck. Even though they read it correctly. Even when they read it correctly. So uh, this was something that we found out through research as well. Uh, we spend a little time to understand that what really happens when the child gets false positive and false negative and what impact does mm. it have on the psychology yeah. and also on the reading experience. So here we are talking about a fact that a simple thing that if the child is reading the word correctly and the speech model doesn't recognize it, it sort of frustrates False positive when they give us those sneaky looks, when they're like, you didn't get me right. But the false negative we realized was really hard on children. Uh, earlier, our experience categorically told the child the words that they didn't get right. We would have a green and a black signal. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever the child would get the word right, it would uh, show it as green. And whenever the child wouldn't get the word right, it would show us black, but sometimes we don't get the words right. Sometimes the machine learning models don't recognize the word exactly. correctly. Yes. And then it remains black. Mm. And then we saw that child would get into a completionist behavior. He would want to turn the all the words into green before moving on to the next page. Oh, okay. And they wouldn't be able to move forward. And that would frustrate the kids. So this is something unique that we found during research. And then we made some changes around that. Uh, we spoke to a few pedagogy experts. We, we are parents ourselves, you know, I have two young kids myself. And we started sort of emulating how we teach in real life. Mm. When the child is reading, we don't really tell him, oh, you got that word wrong. Why don't you read it again? Reading is important for joy of reading. Uh, and we would be a little more forgiving. So we stopped the signal of black and green. If he has read a few words correct in the, in the sentence, mm -hmm. he would be able to pass through the story. Mm -hmm. We realized that this impacted the kids in a very positive way. We truly believe that learning is just not about pronouncing the word right. 
It is also about comprehension. It is also about figuring out what happened in the story, what happened to the character. It is also about evoking imagination, curiosity. So as we heard from Ishita, machine learning models can often output errors, generating false positives and false negatives, which is why it's critical that we understand the human impact of these errors so we can address them in the UX design. The Bolo team is using voice UI and machine learning to help children not just learn how to read, but love it. By growing their confidence in reading, Bolo helps children thrive earlier on and set themselves up for even brighter futures. And as you can see, the Bolo team has designed the entire experience with children and their parents at the center of it, every step of the way. For more guidance on human-centered AI design, check out the People Plus AI guidebook at pair.withgoogle.com. As product creators, we have a responsibility to create things that are focused on the human experience, things that are centered. Okay, and now, now Pragya, you can bring bring in the quiz this on the special oh, and okay. we can do. Yeah, so Mrs. Abhi. So uh, I think I think you've seen a very good application of uh, user centered design on that Bolo app. Just like to run this poll to you to understand that how do you think uh, Bolo is applying AI technology to you know to bridge that gap of learners and tutors in India. Yeah, the poll results. All right, it's equally distributed. Uh, yes, all are um, uh, correct answers here, but mainly wanted to highlight this four key takeaways uh, from that video. Uh, I hope uh, this session has been useful. Uh, that's all from my side. Thank you so much for your time. Um, in the last side, I have left some references for you to refer and learn more about uh, how to use user-centric design on building AI products. Thank you so much for your time. Pragya, are there any questions uh, for me? Audience, do we have any questions? You can ask your questions in the Zoom Q&A window or you can raise your hand and we can unmute you. Prem Prakash has a question. Go ahead. Prem. Go ahead, Prem. You can ask your question. Oh, sorry. Hi, hi, Javi. So, uh, hi. I myself is a data analyst with, uh, who is in the initial stage of, you know, heading towards become a data science uh, uh, parent, right? So I, I would like to understand if there, there are certain books or maybe certain courses that you can recommend uh, for um, the people like us, like who are the aspiring data scientists, uh, you know, uh, which gives us a clear part that how we can make the progress with this. Yeah, I think this is the most common question uh, asked to me. Um, I think the way uh, I like to respond is uh, see the data science and AI is opening multiple streams. Um, you can be a practitioner where you will end up building models, deploying, managing models, 
right? Um, that's one stream. The other stream is there are a lot of other, um, I mean, on the on the consuming side, like you, are, you will essentially not be building models, but you, you will be part of designing, you will be part of planning, uh, some of them can be a project managers or program managers, mainly focusing on AI products, uh, which are more of uh, non-technical roles, I would say. Then, then there are uh, business roles, the strategy roles when it comes to AI, right? I think you have to decide what is the stream that you are more uh, inclined to go and get into. Then accordingly, there are courses because everybody cannot start learning data science from more technical uh, perspective, right? It becomes extremely difficult. Like if you are planning to get into be, if you are planning to be a practitioner, then I, I would suggest uh, start with uh, with self learning first. Get familiarity with some of the core concepts because these days there are very focused courses on certain topics of machine learning. Like for example, say MLOps, and then there are a lot of um, specific topics on AI governance, responsible uh, AI, etc. So what I would suggest is start with self-learning, leverage uh, the online courses. And then um, once you know that, yeah, this is the area where I need more help, I think you can look for uh, you know those kind of courses outside. OK, makes sense. Thank you so much. Thank you. So thank you so much, Zabi, for taking up your time and effort for this masterclass and uh, it was truly an insightful and a brilliant masterclass please accept a token of appreciation from the institute thank you so much Pragya, for giving this chance uh, happy to be stay connected with you guys i'm on linkedin let me know uh, if you have any more questions um, mm -hmm. or feedback about this session thank you so much so audience do share your feedback and uh, thank you so much once again zabi for your time and effort and thank, thank you, you, audience, for joining in on a Saturday morning. Hey, one Have more question. Weekend. How we can get the certificate which is showing on the screen? Uh, for online uh, online um, sessions, we do not provide any participation certificate as such. But you can find out the recording of the session on our YouTube channel or LinkedIn page as well. So. Okay. Cool. I think there is another question. Can we take that up? Uh, yeah, sure, we? sure. We can take it up before. Christiana, do you want to go ahead? Christina, yeah. Christina, you can go ahead. Christiana, you can go ahead. You can talk now. You can speak. It seems that uh, she's not okay, available. Yeah. Sorry, you're not audible. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Please, I would like to learn more about your internship programs, if there's any available. I think it's a question to you, Pragya. Uh, yes, Christiana, we will get in, our team will get in touch with you after the session. All right, thank you. That'll be great. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Audience, do share your feedback. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend, everyone. See you next time.